Illinois. I know as we left home, I think the thermometer at 42 degrees. That is brisk, but beautiful. We have awesome sunshine out there today. We're glad you joined us. My name is Kevin Gray, and I'll be your pastor for the next uh, 30 or 60 minutes. And uh, we're just glad you're joining us, whether it's on our cable channel 13 locally, or Facebook Live, or our YouTube channel later. Thanks for joining us and worshiping with us. Last week's Holy Humor Sunday is going to be hard for us to, uh, to probably follow up. But we were blessed to be able to laugh and uh, be joyous, I guess, in the Lord. Thanks for being with us. Um, today we will have communion. Uh, so if you are so inclined to take communion with us, uh, you might grab a piece of bread or cracker and some juice. Um, because uh, one of the last things we do in our worship today will be to offer communion. And uh, we'll take communion later as uh, staff, the broadcast staff, doesn't that sound official? The broadcast staff here at First View on United Methodist. Um, we'll, we'll take communion this morning after, um, after the worship is over. Gosh, um, next week we will uh, again have communion. That was our traditional time of communion, uh, the first Sunday of the month. And I think we'll get back to that regular schedule again then. Uh, Governor Pritzker has uh, extended the uh, stay-at-home order until uh, the end of May, uh, or quarantine, or whatever you want to call it. But we're delighted that uh, we can be here and, uh, and broadcast. It's always a good time and a good day to worship our God. Let's, uh, let's begin our worship with prayer. Our Lord and our God, we, uh, we love you, and we thank you for the way you love us. You are truly our all in all. Lord, we come before you this morning seeking more and more of your Holy Spirit. Feel each one of us as we... Uh, as we broadcast our worship today, our hope, our desire is that you find our worship worthy. That uh, as we bring you praise and honor and glory, that you, our God, that Jesus and the Holy Spirit receive all that praise, honor, and glory. Lord, we, uh, we also know that we struggle at times as human beings, as your sons and daughters, Lord. Oftentimes we don't love you the way we should. We're not obedient children. And so we come before you today confessing. Confessing, Lord, that, uh, that we need your forgiveness. And Lord, oftentimes we, we neglect to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And so, Lord, we just uh, first and foremost come before you confessing and seeking your forgiveness, Lord. We know you to be a forgiving God. And Lord, not only to forgive us, but also Holy Spirit, fill us in such a way that we might not just be forgiven people, but through the power of your Holy Spirit, we might become forgiving people. Help us to forgive as well. Lord, we also know you to be a healing God. We pray for those who are in need of your physical and emotional and spiritual healing. We pray, Lord. That as we worship you today, that from a spiritual standpoint, that, that this broadcast, this ability to worship would be a balm, a salve, if you will, Lord, for our weary souls. And so, Lord, we just uh, we thank you. We thank you for the ability, all the, the love that you pour out on this world. Uh, may we each sense your, your love and receive some of your peace during these uh, chaotic times. Lord, we love you. We'll forever give you the praise. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Good morning. Let's begin with hymn 156, I Love to Tell a Story. <clears throat>
You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of you, a son of heaven, sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater, and I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The people who has accepted it is certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. John the Baptist was an awesome, awesome prophet, a man of God, a humble man who was willing to accept his role of introducing Jesus to the world around him. While serving as a state uh, FFA president for the Indiana FFA Association and later as a national FFA officer, I had an opportunity to do a fair amount of public speaking. And as you do public speaking, you are going to hear a lot of different introductions. Some of them awesome, and some of them not quite so much. So today I wanted to share with you, uh, oh, maybe one or two introductions that I heard as people were introducing me. But even more importantly, I went out and Googled it, so you know it's got to be good, right? It's good if it's Google. Um, I Googled several of the uh, popular introductions, and I want to share those with you. Here's a few from the internet. Uh, the first one is Neil Simon, and he's introducing the actress Goldie Hawn. Neil says, Goldie Hawn is funny, sexy, beautiful, talented, intelligent, warm, and consistently sunny. Other than that, she doesn't impress me at all. <laughs> Dave Barry is a humorist and an author, and he was introducing a meeting's evening agenda to attendees, and this is what he said, and then we'll hear from the founder of the Mayo Clinic, Dr. William Worrell Clinic. That's preacher humor. He didn't say mayo. He said, never mind. <laughs> Rewind, and maybe you'll get that. George Jessel. George Jessel was explaining how you become a good public speaker before uh, the public speaker was introduced. And this is what he said. He said, uh, a public speaker, you have to practice all the time. And one of the best ways is to put a bunch of marbles in your mouth while you talk. And then slowly but surely, you take away a marble, and then when you've lost all your marbles, you are a public speaker. <laughs> An anonymous introduction was, we were worried that our main speaker wouldn't be able to make it tonight, but fortunately, due to a hole in the prosecutor's case and time served, <laughs> Well, I was once introduced by someone who, uh, who indicated that they had heard me speak before and that my speeches reminded them of a Texas Longhorn. 
He said, Kevin's speeches always start with a point over here and end with a point over here, but there seems to be a lot of bull in between. <laughs> oh, well, what do you do? Well, let's read again how John the Baptist introduced Jesus on two different occasions. If you're a Christian, this is probably one of the most famous introductions in the Bible. And most of you have heard this scripture probably numerous times. We'll be reading from the book of John, chapter 1, and again starting in verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Some translations say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What an introduction, huh? What an awesome introduction. Verse 30. This is the one I meant when I said a man comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. See, on this day, and the reason Jesus is in Jerusalem is because they were observing a holy day. Do you remember which holy day? Passover. Passover, Passover. exactly. There was a tradition within that Passover uh, holy day observance. The tradition started back in Egypt when a family would take a lamb and they would prepare it for their meal on Passover evening. And that night, that first night, they took some of the blood of the lamb and they, they sprinkled it on their doorposts so that that would be a sign. That the angel of death would pass over those homes that had the blood, the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. So when John says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That was a very appropriate topic at the time because so many were here in Jerusalem to observe the Passover. And they knew the liturgy. They knew the story. They knew the words for the Passover celebration. He's revealing to the Israelites, though, something that's uh, probably new to them. That Jesus is not only here for God's chosen people, the, the Israelites, but he's here to take on the sins of the world. The entire world. So if you were a Jew back then, you were accustomed to, well, we are God's chosen people, and so God is going to deliver us. But John the Baptist is also introducing that Jesus isn't here. The Messiah isn't here just for you, God's chosen, but for the entire world. That was new information. Well, verse 32. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. You know the story. Jesus is there. He's being baptized. And as he comes out of the water, the Spirit of God came down like a dove and remained on him. Verse 33. I would not have known him, except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So God gave this vision, this, this prophetic word to John the Baptist. That at some point in time you're going to baptize someone and you will see the, the Spirit of God light upon them like a dove. And the one on whom that Holy Spirit remains is indeed 
the Son of God. That individual will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Verse 34. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. John is again introducing Jesus as the Son of God. And to the people and from a contextual standpoint in Jerusalem, Messiah. The one who had been prophesied to come throughout the Old Testament. Well, moving on to chapter 3 in the Gospel of John, beginning in verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized them. Now John was also baptizing at Anon and near Salim. Because there was plenty of water. And the people were constantly coming to be baptized. Verse 24. This was before John was put in prison. Verse 25. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and they said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about. Well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. In our humanness, right? Rabbi, you're being left behind. That guy you introduced, everybody's going to him now. You're not the big deal that you were. That's how we view things like this in our humanness. Verse 27. To this John replied, A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and now it is complete. Verse 30, he must become greater and I must become less. Another famous Scripture in the Bible. He must become greater and I must become less. Oh, John the Baptist, what a servant you were. Amen? Amen. Because here's a man who was used to the popularity. He was used to the crowds flocking to him and hearing him preach and having him baptized. Calling for people to repent. And suddenly, he is not in the limelight like he was before. Suddenly, the spotlight is not just on John the Baptist. And where you or I, in our humanness, might become jealous or bitter about that, John the Baptist said, We only get what God gives us in him. And you know what? The bride belongs to the bridegroom. And I told you I wasn't the one. The Messiah. The Christ to come. I told you that. What a servant's heart. Verse 31. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth. And speaks as one from the earth. Again, John here is saying, I'm pointing to Jesus, the one from above. He's the one. He's above all. I'm subject to him. The one from the earth. <laughs> I'm just from the earth. That's all I am. He's from heaven.
John had no ego. He was here to play a role today in different productions, whether it be a play or a movie, whether it be a sport. There are superstars and there are role players on teams. And sometimes teams struggle because the role players don't like being second fiddle, second chair, if you will. And yet the reality here is that John knew all along that he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. And so that's where he found his success. Not in judging himself versus others, but in judging himself versus what God's will was for John the Baptist. And in that, he knew who he was. He was here to play a role and honestly probably happy, 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 happy. He said, what joy is it when the friend of the bridegroom gets to hear his voice? What a, what a privilege. Jesus must become more and John must become less. Back to the scripture. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. In other words, we've been telling you that Messiah is coming. I'm telling you that that's who he is. He is here and he's preaching, but no one wants to listen. But those who hear him and understand, they can certify that God that God is indeed truthful. All those things God said was going to happen back in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, we've seen it come to pass. Here He is. Verse 34. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That's a good statement right there. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. You want to live forever? Believe in the Son. But there's a balance within this, this sentence, this statement. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life. For God's wrath remains on him. Again, there's lots of places in the Bible that we would just assume that not be there. That could have put a period right there, right? It would have been fine with all the world. But that's not what God said. God said those who believe in Jesus, the Son of God, will have life. And those that do not will not have life. It's interesting because there are other theologies, universalism, that says everyone will be saved. But that is not a Methodist belief. This clearly states that those who believe will have life. It's important that we believe. Believe that Jesus was and is and always will be the Son of God. Amen. And those who reject the Son of God are rejecting life. Well, all right, I need to take this home. It's the conclusion. Those are usually the favorite words that a speaker can ever say, right? In conclusion, 
We started today talking about introductions, right? Introductions are important. Obviously, today's scriptures indicate how introducing Jesus to the world was John the Baptist's calling. That was God's will for John the Baptist's life. And what greater life can a Christian have than to live out the will of God for their life? John was glad to play his part for the Lord. In the commentary, John for Everyone, authored by N.T. Wright, he says this, C.S. Lewis once put it this way, to play great parts without pride and small parts without shame. That's our calling as Christians today, to pray, play great parts without pride and to play those small parts without shame. Because whether we have a great part or a small part, it doesn't matter if that's God's will for us. Right? Because that's how we should gauge our own success. Are we performing our life within God's will? At the very end of the Gospel, Peter is reminded that what counts is not comparing yourself with other people and seeing whether your status is higher or lower than theirs, but simply following Jesus. Following Jesus is what counts. And yet in our humanness, don't we love to compare our life and our Actions and our sins to all those other people around us. And yet the reality is God doesn't grade on a curve. This scripture kind of indicates his past faith. You believe in Christ and have life. Or you don't. Here already, John the Baptist adds to the evidence he's given about Jesus' Messiahship by insisting that if Jesus is prospering and people are going to him, then that means he, he who pointed to him, should celebrate, not be miserable and jealous. John the Baptist was fulfilled by doing God's will in his life. We should too. Anyone here ever been uh, called into court to testify? Well, it's possible that if you show up but you're unwilling to testify in that court, uh, that you could be held in contempt of court, right? If you're not willing to testify when they call you into court to testify, you could be held in contempt of court. That's in court. A civil matter. What about in our Christian lives? Are you called to testify? Are you going to be held in contempt because you won't speak out for the gospel, for Jesus, for God, for the Holy Spirit? Ow, Pastor, those are my toes you're stepping on. And yet the reality is, is that Jesus and God's Word within the New Testament says that each and every one of us should be able to introduce Jesus to those around us, our family, our friends, our community. You have a job to do, and that job is to testify, to testify, to introduce Do you? Do people around you know where you stand? Where your allegiance lies? Do people around you know where your allegiance lies? Hey, think about this. I know we've got our minds all wrapped around Corona, but it hasn't been that long ago that our biggest complaint wasn't Corona, but was all those political ads we were subjected to, right? 
Here we go. It's an election year. And people were complaining because every other advertisement was politics, 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 right? During an election, people often make it clear who they stand for. They display their preferences on bumper stickers or placards, even on the commercials that they agree with. They show up at rallies and stick signs in their yards. There are also people who don't seem to care or are undecided. We never really seem to know where their allegiance has been placed, do we? Sadly, many Christians fit into these same categories. The world just doesn't know where we stand. Let me challenge you today. If you are a Christian, if you claim to be a Christian, you need to be ready to introduce Jesus Christ to those around you. At a seminar once, I, I heard a speaker who talked about, do you have your, your elevator introduction ready? And everyone kind of scratched their head. What? And he said, for people that we come into contact with, you should have kind of an elevator speech, you know, from one or two floors. That's all the time maybe you have to interact with someone. How would you define your life in Christ in one or two or three floors in an elevator? Have your introduction of Jesus ready. It was important for John the Baptist, and frankly, God calls every Christian to introduce Jesus to their family, their friends, their community. Every Christian. <laughs> this is not debatable or amendable. It does not require a two-thirds vote, folks. Because I can tell you this, God said it in His Word, and that makes it so. Every Christian is called to live their life in a way that they have the ability to testify to the world around them, to introduce people to Jesus. What are you doing to prepare for your Christian calling? Are you prepared to introduce Jesus? That's the question, isn't it? What are you doing to introduce Jesus? And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen.
Amen. Amen. That night in the upper room, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to God. And he turned to those in the upper room and he said this, This is my body, which is given for you. And a little later, during that Passover meal, that Seder supper, if you will, Jesus picked up a cup of wine. Tradition says that it was the third cup within that Seder meal, the cup of redemption. And again, he gave thanks to you, God. And he turned to everyone in the room and he said this, this is the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Each time you eat of the bread or drink of the cup, do it in remembrance of me. And so it is that we have the ability to touch, taste, Heal the body of Christ, which was given for us. For those of you at home now, if you would receive the body of Christ that was given for you. And now you may take the bread. And now, as you lift your cup, you may receive the, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. It's personal. And for many, for the forgiveness of sins, you may drink of the cup. Let us pray. Lord of the psalm, we thank you for the way you love us and the way you pour out your grace and your mercy. This sacrament that we receive today, this Holy Communion, is just one of almost infinite ways you show us your grace and your love and your mercy. We pray, Lord, that we wouldn't be just forgiven people, but that we would also become forgiving people. During this time of our Holy Communion, let us now, in a few moments of silence, let us confess our sins to you, seeking your forgiveness, but then also, Lord, let us remember those that we have need of forgiveness from. Lord, forgive us for And Lord, we seek forgiveness from you as well as Thank you, Lord. Oh, how we love you. And we will forever give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let us close with hymn 593.
Here I am, Lord.
You are our God, our Father. Wow. How could we not do that? But Almighty Father, we heard the story today. We've, many of us have read the book of John. We know what it says. With the coming of Christ, light penetrated the darkness, the light of your love. That's the way the Gospel of John tells us, and it describes the difference that Christ made in our world. Today and every day, we celebrate the light that has overcome the darkness. Lord, here today, in your glorious presence, we lift up our joys, our thankfulness, all of the things that delight us and, and want us to praise your holy name. We lift them up to you, Lord, to glorify you. We also lift up the things that are we are thankful for, such as the essential workers that have been taking on all of this task for our world. We thank you for all of the smiles on the faces of those we see, those who love you, Lord, who are not afraid to speak out for you. We also lift up today our hurts, for many of us have hurts and sorrows that we do not disclose. We lift up those, Lord, who need your healing touch. We have many who are on our list of prayers. We lift them all up to you today. We lift up those who've been going through horrible weather, the tornado victims, the flood victims. We lift up those that are battling cancer. The list seems to grow. And we lift up those who are suffering with coronavirus and fighting it, Lord. And I'm glad to say there are many, many who have successfully done that and are now recovering their health. We ask that you put your loving hand on our seniors and protect them, for they are so vulnerable. We give these all to you, Lord, to the light, that they may be filled with the light, restored, and made whole. And Lord, I almost forgot. I ask that you put your light in those who do not know you, those who have not heard your name or have not known you personally. I ask that you shine your light brightly in them, that they may then be sent into the world, carrying the light of Jesus in their hearts and in their spirits as beacons of hope. Make us all, Lord, into joyful friends like John the Baptist, who are happy to point others to your chosen one among us, our soul-saving, self-giving bridegroom, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Folks, please pray, pray the Lord's Prayer with me, for he says, when you pray, pray like this, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Don. Thank you for leading us in prayer. And folks, just uh, want to also mention that um, if you are interested in seeing our uh, entire prayer list, uh, the In Touch weekly publication has been emailed today, but it will also end up posted on our website as well as our Facebook page. And so there you can find a complete listing of those folks that we have placed on our prayer list. And, and if you would like to add more, then please uh, go to our Facebook page or email us and, uh, and let us know your prayer requests. 
You know, each week, the last few weeks, I've said if you've enjoyed our service, then you might consider contributing. And uh, I hope you are enjoying our service, and we certainly appreciate the contributions. But the other side of that is, is that it's not just about us paying our bills and, and you helping us out. You know, God sets in place things that we're to do, and we think that by giving an offering, by by bringing our first fruit, by bringing our tithe, that, that we're, we're helping the church and we're helping God. And, and that is true. But God also knows that we, we are blessed when we have a generous heart. And so, I'm just trying to tell you the way I feel it is in the Bible. And that, uh, not anything more than that. You know, may you be blessed. Um, in this week to come. And now in the name of God the Father and Jesus Christ, His holy and perfect Son, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, may you be blessed. May God keep you in the palm of His hand. Amen and amen.